world. <laughs> so we can go ahead and I see you've hit the record. Wonderful. So let's go ahead and get started. We have a few people online. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, the rest of people can join as they can. Um, so let's go ahead and just get started. A uh, couple of things. So uh, those of you who just joined, you are muted to minimize the background noise, but we encourage you throughout the session to please use the chat box to chat with us, to chat with one another, ask us questions, you know, share your experiences. We're all here to learn from one another. We have um, a really exciting uh, about 45 minute conversation uh, uh, prepared for you guys around this very important topic that I'll introduce in just a moment, but we'd love to have your, uh, your thoughts and, and feedback as well as we go through this. So during COVID times, one of the biggest catalysts for change in organizations has been the people behind human resources. And things have been piling up on desks of HR, right? So you have the day-to-day -day processes, the culture change at work, well-being of your employees, digitalization project, and the list goes on and on. Many agree that the department, this is that the department is the, one of the biggest disruptions during these times. And for those of you who are coming from HR on this on this webinar, you can certainly relate. So this is a time to really ask yourselves who is taking care of you while you're taking care of others, and how can you have the mental resilience to cope with the tsunami of changes, the amount of work, and make the department a, a key stakeholder in times of transformation. In this short uh, conversation, we're going to talk to you a little bit about how the HR shifted in organizations, kind of from guardian to, of processes to essentially human empowerment. We're going to look at the top three resources for HR in these times of change, which is resilience, growth mindset, and empathy. And finally, we're going to look at how can we really embrace the future with confidence and, and essentially have the, the, the know-how and the step-by-step -step to implement as we're moving forward. Um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide. Before we go into the topic of discussion, I want to just take a moment and introduce ourselves, who we are, why are we here, why do we care about these topics, and what we're here, um, uh, where we come from, essentially. So quickly about myself, I am uh, Elena Agra. I come from background of learning and development, higher education. I've been in this field for over 12 years, having worked in various organizations across the Middle East and the US as well. Um, really passionate about it, about these topics. I think personal development, professional development across board is something that has seen a significant push. Um, um, uh, across organizations globally. I think even more significantly, the piece about self-awareness, which is very close to my heart, is essential. And, and that's why I'm excited about this discussion because at the end of the day, in order for us to take care of others in our organizations, we really need to have that self-awareness piece and, and make sure that we are taking care of ourselves through these difficult times. Fernanda? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. This is a first for me, and I'm really excited to be able to, to speak to everybody and, and yeah, just to, to hear the feedback from, from our participants. Um, as Elena said, I'm Fernanda Martinez. I'm originally from South Africa, uh, but now living in Lisbon in Portugal. Um, my background is in public health, and I worked for a number of NGOs and, and organizations focused on impact-driven projects. Uh, and obviously, through changes of, of my own, through my own life decided to to delve into productivity and well-being as I did feel there was a cohesiveness between public health uh, as a science um, of improving uh, the health of people and communities um, and the scope that it had you know within this this uh, area of productivity and well-being and, and that's who I am. <laughs> Hello everybody so my name is Ivan um, I have a background, in fact, in a, 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 as an engineer. So I have been always passionate by the, the science be, behind the acts that we do. Why do we do certain things? And how can we nudge people to do the best they can, but using, in fact, how the brain process information. So I have been passionate about behavioral science. I, uh, and because uh, of my background, I had to get a little bit of numbers to talk about to see if this is something that is really working and having an impact on the day-to-day -day life of, of, of people. Uh, in my previous corporate life, I have been dealing in the areas of marketing. Oh, by the way, this is where you use the most behavioral science because you need to nudge people to buy things that they don't need. Uh, and I have been also responsible for uh, corporate innovation. Uh, that's a little bit about myself. 
and just to, to recap, what we do at Benson is that we are so passionate about the, the area of self-development, in, in particular, the role that the brain plays in order to have the capacity to do things that are very hard to, to do, very hard to change. So we write about it in different magazines. We have been writing in the Entrepreneur and Thrive Magazine in Forbes. We have been also been supported by certain um, incubators and accelerators in the, in the MENA, MENA region because we work with technology in order to, to make it accessible, this, uh, this support that you need in your day-to-day -day life. So we have been working also with the Ministry of Wellbeing and Happiness here in, uh, uh, in the UAE. So that's a little bit of our uh, story. And now I'm going to stop sharing this screen because we need to discuss. Yeah. It. Let's have a conversation. Listen, let's let's keep this quite informal and just kind of have that conversation again. I, I, I encourage those online uh, to to jump in. You have the chat. Just kind of chat with us. Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. But let's just kind of set the scene a little bit, Ivan. So we've seen this kind of shift in organizations, the, in particular for HR professionals, right? So kind of from this guardian of processes that now we see this shift towards human empowerment. Talk to us a little bit kind of what happened over the last year or so in that sense. Elena, let's refer back about the life pre-COVID. We still remember the times where human resources were perceived as an administrative support function uh, for corporations. So what happens is more or less that is that they were the guardians of processes, processes to administer uh, people. <clears throat> so the age of human was slightly disappearing uh, in the pile of things, ad administrative tasks that people had to do in a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Uh, and they didn't have the time to, to get back to the core of, of, of what is important. Now, what is super important is that during COVID, it's almost like there was a wake up of the function. I have never seen a num the number of postings coming from so many human resources people in LinkedIn, if you see, every single day, I was having five to 10 different postings that doing videos related to the human aspect, related to the well-being of the people, related about how to learn better, how to manage your stress during these conditions. It's almost that they, like they have become the voice of these silent people at work who doesn't dare to push a, a post because it might be dangerous in, in the corporate environments, or this is how they feel. So human resources have played a role in order to promote and, and, and voice over this, uh, the voices of employees. So there, there has been changes, in fact, and it's not me who is saying it, it's more about some uh, latest research that has been done regarding the, uh, the HR impact during the pandemic. Uh, so there has been uh, they have highlighted that protecting workforce health and safety has been something that has progressed quite a lot thanks to human resources. Increasing communications with the workforce, that's also something where, uh, where human resources have been pushing a lot. And the last point that is super important and dear to our hearts, and that, you know, guys, it is promoting worker well-being. This is something that it has been uh, that, that it has been quite impactful that to, to see that there hasn't been any fear to speak out about the necessity to change things. Because if we look at that, COVID, it wasn't that awesome from the human perspective in corporations. So the, the focus is slightly shifting from let's work because there is shareholder value that we need to produce to let's work to, in order to create a better, uh, a better place. What do you think, Fernanda? What have you seen? <laughs> um, so yeah, just going back to, to what you were saying, absolutely. I mean, pre-COVID, I think the machine worked in a very different way. Um, it was certainly, it was more about creating um, an organization that was more about sustainable competitive advantage and, you know, reaching those numbers and making sure your shareholders were happy. And, you know, here came COVID and it really, it, it, it put everyone up against a wall and completely shifted the values and the approach to, to how to work um, and, and still maintain 
a, a safe and a, a, a healthy environment, not only for, for personnel within HR, but for the employees. And it was almost fast tracking so many different things at the same time to, to try and, and manage the expectation from the top and manage expectation from your staff and from the, from the employees that um, I, I feel that HR being that voice lost their voice completely because it was having to relate to people on so many different levels you know empathy for one it wasn't just em empathy is you know simply you could break it down into three categories it's cognitive it's it's um, emotional it's compassionate and that that emotional aspect of empathy it's like watching a movie um you know that sort of ties you know pulls at your heartstrings and makes you cry it's the same when you're dealing with employees when you're listening to everything that's going on of course you're going to feel impacted by that um and there you know it's kind of attention all hands on deck trying to find these these solutions you know to to improve a situation but then the upshot of that is hr themselves sitting and not having any Anybody, you know, that's having the same reaction and, and being able to assist them. <laughs> that's right. I, <clears throat> by the way, I warn you guys that I'm, a, I'm the person who is into numbers. Otherwise, I cannot believe it if it is not written with a number. Uh, I wanted to get back to, uh, how is it called, the human capital uh, trends from Deloitte, the 2021 results. So there was, uh, there was a survey in order to understand what is the perception of uh, how human resources navigating the, for the future change. Uh, uh, and pre-COVID, in fact, 26% of executives didn't trust at all HR in terms of, they weren't confident on the capabilities of HR to, 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 to manage change. Uh, and suddenly during COVID, wow, well, only 12% of people believe that they are not. So imagine that the reduction. So, what they have been doing today, and it's just the start, the minimum viable product of, of a big change that where they are getting back this reputation that they used to have uh, as, the, as the human hub of, in, in an organization, and they're getting back this confidence from, from the executive level as well from the, the full organization. This is quite promising, but as I, as I mentioned before, it's just the start because the, the, the work ahead in terms of human resources, it is big because it looks like it has been a sleeping giant for a while. So there is a lot of catch up to be done in order to, to change, to reformalize, to recreate the workplace, the culture in an organization. Many corporations are ongoing into transformation and transformation doesn't mean only digitalization. It means also having a cultural change and the role of human resources inside of this design, it is important, it's critical. And the big question is, how can you do, deal with this big scope of change if you're still having the administrative task, having a 300 Excel sheet to manage the payroll, to manage a absence, to manage whatever, you will, it, it simply will not work. Now the big question is, how can we first redesign the workplace inside of human resources so that they have the time to take care of others. And this is something that we need to, to dig a little bit more, right, Elena? Absolutely. So as, as we've seen the shift, I would assume that there are probably certain sort of resources that come along with, with managing sort of change, right? So and uh, Fernando already kind of mentioned one, which is the empathy, but I'm curious, is there other, other, other resources that HR need to consider uh, when, they're with, when dealing with any change essentially, but in this particular case with the, in the, uh, their HR structures? Um, I would certainly definitely, I mean, there, there's always room for improvement. And I think one of the, the biggest things that HR could focus on for themselves is, is also try and adopt a growth mindset. I mean, that in itself would make a huge difference because it's, it's important for 
it's important for them to believe that their most basic abilities can be can be further developed, you know, uh, through dedication and hard work. And by doing that, that will also build, you know, the person's resilience. Um, and at the moment, with all the pressures and everything that's happened, um, there seems to be this, this overwhelming pressure on HR personnel about things that haven't been achieved, because obviously, you know, goals have had to change, they've had to be realigned. So perhaps it's kind of, it's, it's trying to change that view that it's not a failure. You know, don't, this is not a failure. These are opportunities for growth and for appreciating the process more than the end goal. Um, you know, it, just adopting that growth, that growth mindset would also help further develop that that yearning and that love for learning and keeping up to date you know with with things that are happening not only within your organization but other organizations because as we all know there is no such thing as one size fits all but you never know what could not be working for you could work for somebody else so just to continue and to encourage that that communication and that networking of hr um HR personnel, just to keep talking, because the more we talk about something, the more likely you're going to be able to find a solution that's cohesive and something that will, that will be able to apply, be able to be applied, um, you know, across the board. So definitely focusing on, on, on that growth mindset, I think, would, would have enormous benefits. Hmm. Very often, and, and I'm going to, to bring the scientist hat again, <clears throat> very often we believe that Okay, growth mindset, learning new things. It is tough. I'm, uh, I don't know, 30 plus, 40 plus or whatsoever. How the hell am I going to learn new things? I am a human resources. I, I am not a data scientist. Um, well, let's reframe that to understand a little bit of some basics of, of, of how the brain works. So in principle, our, uh, our brain functions most of the time with two, uh, two lines, let's say. Either I get fear because it's a change or, or either I get excited, pleasure. So we produce certain chemicals and our messages is in our brain and these messages in our brain either can block our vision for what can we do? And then we say, oh, I'm not good in math. Oh, I'm not good in that. This is, this is not for me. This is for the IT department. Um, <clears throat> so we, we start having this limiting belief. So I, now we are just trying to merge these two worlds of coaching with uh, neuroscience to, in order to understand that there is a high correlation of how the brain perceives the realities and, <clears throat> and the, the, the way to do action. So what we strongly believe is that when we talk about either growth mindset to continuously learn new, uh, new things and have a positive view is that you can, in order to reduce the impact of the fear that this is something that we cannot control, it will always be there. So what we have to do is just trick the brain in order to, that he doesn't perceive it as, a, a, as fear. So what is recommended, it is to divide it in small actions. So let's imagine that one of the things that I want to do as a human resources responsible is to know, okay, the big new trend in human resources is going to be automation. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that I'm going to become a coder tomorrow. I, I will not do it. I don't want, I, I, I'm not built for that, but I need to be aware of how automations can help me reduce the number of administrative tasks or understand how artificial intelligence can help me, can help uh, create better workplaces. Not that it's going to replace a, 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 an employee, but how can in artificial in intelligence empower the employee to do the best they can to add on in, into the creativity, to have more time to be strategic because believe me, in order to be strategic, and I have seen it in, in my previous job, is that there is always someone who says, oh, you are not strategic enough. Of course, if you don't have the time to be strategic, to make the, uh, the time, the, 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 uh, the brain needs to have an unstructured environment to be strategic. It doesn't come just naturally. It, it needs to, uh, the brain needs to practice. Uh, and so what I'm saying, coming back to, to, to the, the main idea of how to start is to start small. So. If I need to do a big task, which it is 
become more knowledgeable in artificial intelligence. It means how can I devote every day for the next month, for instance, five minutes to learn something about artificial intelligence? How can I identify the time of the day where nobody is going to be bothering me? There is not going to be a Zoom call. There is not going to be a WhatsApp uh, coming up, uh, a message from my boss and have the five minutes to groom myself into a small little steps, a small little knowledge and uh, knowledge of uh, in a daily basis so that we create a routine and this routine is not perceived by the brain as, as change. And then it's becoming more exciting. And we need to be able also to track that we are progressing because the brain needs to generate dopamine in order to, uh, in order to keep motivated to create a, um, I will say the fact that it becomes necessary for the next time to repeat it, uh, to repeat it again. Uh, so it is important to start a small, to don't look at the task like, oh, close mindset is I need to read 20, 20 books. No, you need to make two pages every day. You need to start in a, in a more consistent manner in a daily basis, rather than looking for this big intensity that makes things very difficult and then we get demotivated and then we feel worthless and then nothing happens. So that's a, a good way to start in terms of the growth mindset. Personal experience, um, for instance, at, at Besson, uh, uh, you guys, Fernanda and, and Elena, you know quite well. So we have a dedicated time in a daily basis to, because we need to be up to date on everything that is happening regarding behavioral science, neuroscience, new ways of, uh, of learning. So there is an allocation of time. It doesn't mean that we have blocked in our calendar two hours every day. We have blocked approximately between five to 10 minutes, depending on the person, to read and be aware about everything that is happening, be up to date in order to be able to progress every single day and bring novelty to our customers, bring, bring latest things and not the past, not the CIPD, ATD, programs that they have for 20 years. Okay, I went too far, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so far, what I'm hearing you guys saying is that there's definitely been the shift, right? So we started talking about how there's been the shift, which means that once that happened, we need to also reconsider the sort of resources that we need as human resource professionals in order to be able to manage this change. A big part of that is empathy, right? So, and I know we're gonna talk a little bit more towards the end about how do you actually implement empathy? What does that mean from self-empathy to, to em being empathetic with others? There's also seems to be a piece about resilience that you guys have mentioned in terms of how do we actually manage this, this change and what are the tactics? And I know we're gonna, we're gonna give the audience the, the key takeaway about that as well. And finally, Ivana, I want to bring back to what you were just now talking about, and it's that growth mindset, right? Talking about uh, being curious, like, you know, trying to find more information about how can you optimize your own performance, right? How can you make, take care of your well-being within, within this change? And as you mentioned, it doesn't have to be small, big changes. It can be those small that you've very, very nicely just described for us. But I'm curious, taking it to the, to the next step and bringing in the technology in it. So, uh, Ivan, I know you love this topic, so I'm going to, I'm going to just let you have at it. But in terms of like when it comes to tech, is there something that can help us as human resources to make our job easier in addition to what you've already stated, right? Like what else in terms of how can we proceed to the, towards the future with full confidence um, in our professions? Other tools that can make it simpler for us? Hmm. So uh, before I answer that question, I wanted to answer someone posted in the, in the, in the chat about artificial intelligence. Uh, and I, I cannot agree more with, the, uh, with this comment. So technology is not made to replace the value of human. Humans are made to be creative. Machines cannot. Technology should be adding or uh, allowing humans to unleash their creativity, the whole potential, the, the way to, to find, find out solutions that cannot be matched by, uh, by technology. And, and when we go and decide to, <clears throat> to create a, a new system that will allow us to spend less time calculating uh, payrolls or calculating taxations or, 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 or managing process, uh, 
we need to find out a way to create technology that works uh, as an end consumer, the employee. Something that really facilitates is around, is to facilitate the work of the employee and is not to replace him. It cannot be, it is not possible that, uh, uh, that an employee can be replaced. And, and by the way, and this is something that has changed drastically because pre-COVID, there was a lot of discussions about artificial intelligence and the impact that it can have in replacing non, what, they, what people call non-adding value uh, jobs. But let me tell you something, these non-added added value jobs are made by people and these people are made to learn at any time. So this is the big, the, the, the big thing that has happened during COVID is that we have understood that the human potential, these people who are fully resilient, maybe the ones who are doing uh, administrative tasks in, in a day-to-day -day basis, but these people know a lot about the culture. They are the most loyal people in the, uh, in the company, are the ones who have been supporting others during, uh, during COVID time. And now we understand that we cannot just say, okay, we are going to outsource these people by someone in another, uh, uh, in another country or by uh, an automatization of the accounting uh, system or whatsoever. These people have a, a value and the system should be able to, uh, to allocate the, the value of this person into something that the machine cannot do. So it's not about thinking about who can do the task, but what role people plays in, the, in, the, in, the, in a human work, uh, workplace. Now, coming back to, uh, to your question. <clears throat> so it is impossible to be, uh, to be realistic that the, the task of human resources is big. Uh, it's about cultural change, reworking, recreating the, 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 uh, the workplace, uh, allowing people to, uh, to upskill, reskill, uh, because everybody needs that. Uh, and the, the, the funny thing is that not so many solution providers are out there in order to, to, uh, uh, to help people in terms of how to not only know about something, but have the mental capacity to do it. It's like a little bit, and I always refer about my personal, ex personal life example. I, when I talk to so many people during a day, my brain is dread, uh, is like, I cannot hold it. You need to, to be able to exercise this mental capacity because a lot of people knows how to take care of the well-being, how to communicate and whatsoever, but we just don't have the, 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 the energy to do it. And so we need to be able to train people, not only on knowledge, but on how to manage your brain or psychological processes. To do that, so let's get back because I'm always getting a little bit uh, lost. We need to automatize or do something about the number of administrative tasks that human resources is having, uh, is having today. It cannot be possible that certain things have been dumped on human resources and is purely administrative. It cannot be that human resources replaces the job of managers in terms of the responsibility to groom, upskill, reskill their direct reports. It cannot be that uh, human resources are the ones reading the uh, appraisal, yearly appraisal uh, plans uh, in order to correct with the, uh, what the managers are, are doing. That are tasks that need to be sincerely re-engineered uh, re around the new culture that we want, uh, that a company wants to do. If you want to be quite evolving company look forward looking, you need, you need to have uh, the, a certain level of accountability that, uh, that comes in, uh, into, um, into, this, um, into the new re-engineered uh, place where people feel accountable for that change. <clears throat> but in order to do that, you need to develop this story of how do you make people want to learn more, want to uh, be more innovative, want to change. And that's something that needs to be uh, embedded. So we talk about the administ administrative task. The other thing is about <clears throat> we, the, uh, it's not about the specific technology, but it's at the, the level of understanding of human psychology. 
<clears throat> needs to be upgraded in human resources so that uh, they are capable to understand how technology can help uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And secondly, how the psychology, what is the psychology of learning? If you need to upskill and reskill people in, in, in the workplace, it's not enough to say, okay, I will do a bidding, I will ask 10 guys to, do a, uh, to give me an offer for these trainings. That's not how it works, a full transformation. A full transformation is we don't know what is the future, but we need to create the processes, the mental processes in people to learn by themselves because it's not worthwhile having an external coming to say, I will teach you about blockchain, I will teach you about time management because the principles can be found in any internet YouTube, uh, YouTube video. What we need is to generate the willingness of the employees to learn. And so for that, some basic understanding of how people learn, the modern learner works, it is super important. Ivan, you have covered so many topics. I don't even know which one to pick up on at this point. But <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, it's beautiful because all of this, but I want to, so I, I think you've covered a couple of different things. So talking about challenges HR experiencing and kind of the overload of work that they have to manage. And, and in some cases, right, like, I mean, when it comes to HR, a lot of things are dumped on HR, the administrative tasks that you've mentioned, and that we cannot... It depends on the organization. You cannot always control it. But I'm curious, as an HR professional, who, who's, you know, those who are listening on this call, I'm curious, you know, what are the actual tips and strategies we can give them? And I want to kind of bring it back to Fernanda on this and, and have her share with us some of these action points of wonderful. I'm an HR person. I know I need to be curious. I know I need to be resilient. I know I need to have all this growth money. How do I do it? How do I control the things that I can control and embed into what I do? Because at the end of the day, I need to lead by example. So in order for me to implement some of these changes in our organization, I need to be able to do them myself. So Fernanda, I know you have lots to say about that. So talk to us a little bit. Let's start with resilience because that's a big topic, right? I think so. Yeah. Thanks, Elena. So I, I think, you know, the first first call for action right now, um, and it's as you say, so much has been dumped on the desk of HR. It's kind of here you go, fix it, help us, you know, from from being not particularly you know, vilified almost to now the unsung hero of every organization. And, you know, heaven forbid anything happens because, you know, they wouldn't know what to do without HR now. Um, first First action point for, for anybody in HR is to really, we have to bring it back to yourself. It has to start with that resilience. You Nobody, and it's not just HR, it's not only in your professional life, it's in all aspects of your life. If you are running on low, if your batteries are about to die, you're not going to be effective in anything that you do. So that would be my first point of call. So start small, start with just with, with things that you can control, even if it's creating a better eating healthy habit for yourself instead of grabbing you know believe me i'm guilty of this instead of grabbing a block of chocolate or a slab of chocolate more like it for me you know what think about it consider what that chocolate is going to do to your energy levels you're going to feel amazing for maybe 20 minutes and then you're going to hit a brick wall and you're going to hit it hard and then you still already don't have that resilience level to build up so it's small things changing your eating habits, exercising regularly, making time for yourself and, and detaching. You know, we, we are not built to be on the go 24 hours a day. On the contrary, we are probably our most effective anything between 90 to 120 minutes. And that's at a push where we can really remain focused. Make a conscious decision that every hour and a half you step away even if it's to look outside your window, even if it's to pick up the phone and say hello to a friend, those are the necessary actions that need to be taken. We, 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 we're actually focusing on what is going to help us cope and manage better with the day-to-day -day, you know, pressures of life. Um, I know it is difficult at the moment, specifically for HR to say, oh yes, you need to take the time. Sometimes you can't, you know, your 12 hour day has now turned into a 16, 17, 18 hour day, particularly for people that are still, you know, in lockdown that are now really having to work, be mother, father, uh, HR, uh, friend, brother. It, it, it's insane to kind of manage all these things. But the fact is, is that we have to force ourselves to, because if we don't, we are going to, we are going to just make ourselves ill. 
um, and it's going to impact every aspect of ourselves it's going to start affecting how we how we see our values we're going to start feeling that you know we, we're not going to feel confident in what we do professionally personally um you know the upshot of not taking the time to focus on your own self-care is it really it's terrible so small please how eat healthily um try and exercise regularly i'm not saying go out there and run 10 kilometers but you know what to do stretching it starts small do a little floor work for 10 minutes um some time out gosh if you don't even want to spend time with family and friends time on your own is good you know if you don't if you're you know don't compare yourself to other people. I find that a lot of people I've spoken to on their off time, they end up sitting in front of their phone on social media and that just makes them feel even worse about themselves because everybody else's life looks so fabulous and theirs looks as if it's about to explode. You know, <laughs> don't do that. Rather, honestly, rather read a book or, you know, explore the curiosity of doing a course in mindfulness, something that you've never done before. Um, and more importantly, with everything that is going on, if there's something that you are not feeling comfortable with, stand up for yourself. Stand up for yourself. Voice the concern. Um, avoid these toxic relationships. Whatever toxic relationship you've got in your life, start taking those steps to, to eliminate them. Um, and it, be it a, a toxic relationship or an agenda that you feel might be sinister, start controlling those things. You don't need to engage in that. You, you have the choice and, um, and ask for help. There is nothing wrong in saying, guys, I'm full up. I can't do this anymore. I, I, I need some help. Um, but again, it has to start with you. It has to start. It has to come from a place where you're going to allow yourself that vulnerability to admit to yourself that you're tired. Of course, you're tired. I don't know if you guys have had a look at the last year. It's been insane. It's <laughs> what, what's happened. So resilience let's just yeah small little steps and then it becomes second nature you you you'll know immediately how to how to identify what's going to help identify what's not going to help um and things will just get a lot better and easier from there fernanda you say something that is quite true and uh, <clears throat> it is one of my favorite topics in fact it's about mindfulness at work so the thing is that there is this association of mindfulness with meditation, which is completely wrong. Mindfulness, it means just to be reminded of, reminded of, of our own emotions, reminded of, of taking a break because we need to recharge because the energy in our brain is something that can come back, but you need to just to space out, as you say, just to empty yourself for a couple of minutes so that when you come back, your brain is fully charged to start a, a, a new task. So taking breaks is super important, but for that you need to be, to have like a mindful way of dealing with your, uh, with your work. So mindfulness encompass, in, encompasses the, the fact that to know each other, to be able to identify and recognize and trigger an action out of, when I recognize that I'm having that emotion, I do this, or remind me to do something. Some people I have, have a trick. I touch my, the love of my ear. When I, I having an emotion that I know that I need to control, or uh, I mindfulness in terms of allocation of, of a personal time to recharge, especially now that we are working from home, it is super difficult. This is the kind of things that we are talking in a day-to-day -day basis with, with, with the people, uh, people at work is how to manage this differentiation of the borders, how to, to remove Outlook, to remove WhatsApp just for five to 10 minutes so that the brain load goes away. And, and to even remind yourself, and you mentioned something about social, social media, that taking a break, it means emptying your brain. It doesn't mean checking Facebook. You think it relaxes you, but it's an additional information that load you and you are as much tired and as much not recharged if, if you had been working. So mindfulness uh, it is one of the, the most trending topics, courses that people are, uh, 
are working with us. So, and we feel, we feel that this is a, like one of the biggest changes in, in terms of learning at work is the managing the process that are going to help you have a better life, be more productive, be the master of your of your day to day and having at the end this good sleep, uh, this good sleep that it, it is just to go to bed and you're dead instead of being worried about the next next task that is going to happen tomorrow, which uh, we have lived through uh, at one moment in our lives. Absolutely, and it is exactly that. And I think I think people have actually forgotten the sim the simple th the things that are actually simple things in our lives that that make the biggest difference. Just a good night's sleep. I know for myself, I. I've never been someone who slept a lot, but I tell you, when I sleep, I sleep very deeply. And there's a difference between not sleeping deeply and it, it's just being able to get into my bed and not have to think about anything other than how much I'm going to enjoy my night's sleep and waking up that next morning, feeling completely recharged and ready. And I think the other thing as well is for, for anybody who feels that, that, the pressures of life and particularly in HR and I'm, I'm going to say it you know HR have now kind of been put in the situation where they're expected to sort of listen to understand but can't respond that has to be flipped around it has to change because who's going to listen to understand them if you're just listening to have a chance to respond you're not helping anything listen to listen do it actively be able to reflect um exercise that empathy you know you, you you need to put yourself in the person's shoes um, if not every all these steps that have been taken to ensure that we have come as far as we have come i promise you will start regressing and the the shortfall will be huge it's going to the impact of that will be even more devastating because everybody has their limit um, so it's time to kind of continue building, continue learning, and, and our pillars that are offering us this infrastructure, let's start looking after them. Hmm. They need the support. It is clear that the task for human resources, is, it is big. So it's about building human cap capability and, and technological capability to transform the workplace. So we're talking about building an organizational culture that celebrates growth, adaptability, and resilience. These are not trainings, by the way. Uh, building a workforce capability for uh, through upskilling, reskilling, that's something that is important. Implementing technologies that are made around the human being and not to replace the human being. Uh, that looks like a big task. And hopefully understanding that the, in order to start the change, it needs to start within us. We cannot expect a transformation of a full organization if we are not capable of learning more, uh, having the growth mindset, managing our resilience. All of these things, we as HR are the first experiment before we throw it out because people are going to feel if you are genuine or not. So, and God knows that human resources needs this type of, of support in order because we know that it has been a tough year. It was already tough because of the lack of recognition in the previous years, but today they have shown us the way, a way that is working for them to be more recognized in terms of the capability and the strategic role for the future in an organization. So let's, uh, let's keep on moving. I need to go back. Uh, to pick up on that, Yvonne, um, as we know, a lot of these things are great to implement, but we need help. And it's not always that we're able to do this on our own. And I think this is where we're definitely, this is part of part of how we want to kind of wrap up this session is to, to say, listen, you don't have to do it alone. We're happy to have a conversation around some of the challenges you might be having as HR in your organizations. No strings attached. Really, we mean it. No strings attached. Do you want to talk to us? Book a call with us. Um, Let's have a conversation. Uh, again, you don't have to do this alone. And yes, we have shared different kind of strategies and tips of what you can do to sort of get started on this transformation with yourself. But again, we're very, we're very mindful that we all need support from time to time and a live human support. So please do get in touch with us if there's any particular things that you might 
um, still have questions about from this webinar that you might not feel comfortable discussing now. Um, and at this stage, I want to just invite um, whoever is online to ask questions, uh, share your thoughts, share your experience. What do you, what do you, you know, what what changes do you see in your particular roles as HR? So just um, let us know if there is something that you guys have questions about. And maybe we can keep that slide up, Yvonne, for a minute. I'm going to be putting, in fact, the, uh, the links in the chat so that it is easier to copy and paste. OK, perfect. Yeah, so let's, um, let's see if you guys have any questions. It's a big topic. It's a big topic and uh, a big topic that is not easy to cover in 45 minutes, but uh, hopefully, if anything, it inspired some of you to, to recognize that the change starts with yourself and that, as Fernanda mentioned, what I love is the fact that it doesn't need to be huge. It can be small things as far as just getting good sleep, eating healthy nutrition. We, I don't think we recognize how much that affects our mindset throughout the day. So, and, and the point that Yvonne brought together is that the way our brain learns at the end of the day is in small micro habits. So whatever we're talking about, doesn't need to be this huge life changes. It can be five to 10 minutes a day that you just adapt to whatever might work for you not what works for us or anybody else, what works for you specifically. Hmm. So we're here for any questions. And I think just to add to that, I think it's also important to note that, you know, we all have our energies change throughout the day. I mean, for myself, I, I don't know, I, I am far more productive in the morning. Uh, you know, my perfect day would kind of start at 5 a.m. and finish at 2 in the afternoon. That is honestly where I can really be my most effective and productive. Whereas some people, it's the opposite. And I think being able to recognize when you are at your best is important. Don't force the issue. If you, you know, that's kind of, that is, that's how you're built. So if you know that early, early mornings for you, um, on you're just going to be sitting there like a zombie, you know, change your day, you know, work it around what works for you, because then you'll actually, it's enjoying what you do. There has to be a sense of enjoyment in everything that we do. If not... <laughs> What's the point? Exactly. That produces fulfillment and fulfillment is what makes us avoid burnout and stress and so on. So this is a, this is a very good point, in fact. Uh, as we, we have, have a, a quick question. Of... Sorry, we have a question. Yes. Um, so HR are experimenting on employees in this pandemic. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> experimentation it is good when there is no um, nothing that can tell you what is the future made about when there is a lot of uncertainty doing nothing is the worst that can happen for an organization experimenting and allows you to the risk the future to reduce the impact of not doing uh, anything so if your experimentation is is something that will not where the risk of harming people is low, go and do it. We don't know what is, in fact, there is nothing written that was preparing us for these COVID times. So doing nothing is the worst that can happen. Experimenting, it is something that is highly recommended, doing small steps. This is not anymore the time where you are going to be doing implementations of SAP HR systems that are going to cost you 1 million plus. Go and do the minimum to, to deliver in what is the main pain for your organization. Don't overinvest in long training processes. We are in the world where everything is in agile mode. The development of a system, the development even of trainings, you can, you know, you're not going to deliver all full program about leadership development and maintain it for the next 10 years. Everything is changing every single day and you need to be able to adapt to the changes based on the feedback of the users, either the ones who are using your system or the ones who are listening to your, to your training. So let's go and experiment a little bit more. I think that in the industry of transformation, this is uh, something that is quite highly used in terms of product development, services development. I wish that this way of doing iterations with the small little steps works not only for your personal life, but also for 
the way we are doing things in human resources, in other departments, in any department. Hmm. I, I just to add to that, I mean, I think you, you've covered everything that I would have wanted to say. I think that right now, the worst thing to do is not to do it. You, now's not the time to sit idly. And there's a very good saying, nothing ventured, nothing gained, provided it is done in an ethical manner and that it's not at the expense of anybody's, you know, well-being, physically, mentally, emotionally, but absolutely go out there, experiment. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the lessons that we learn are through experimentation as well. So... Yeah, just to offer that further iteration to what okay. um, Hans said. Um, there is another, another question. Yeah, we have another question. How are HR professionals going to manage attendance issues in bureaucratic institutions, especially related to the government through online tools? And after COVID, can online and virtual work places thrive? <laughs> That's a good question. I love this question. In fact, is a little bit provocative and at the same, so true. The reality is that <clears throat> there is either organizations, governmental or non-governmental, that are not ready for change. You cannot expect to replicate the same processes. So if in the past you were checking that everybody was entering at work and getting out either with fingerprints or with a card or the puncher, I don't know if somebody's using still the puncher. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Me. <laughs> <See thing. laughs> so um, you cannot anymore. And, and let me give you a clear example. Um, <clears throat> there is a trend called presentation, where people show up, sit in their in the desk, and they are not doing what they're paid for. Uh, they are not productive. They are there because mentally, they are living in a moment where there is a lot of uncertainty. They are not ready. They are, some of them, they might be close to the burnout in the burnout mode and leaving problems at home because maybe the wife has lost or the husband has lost, uh, has lost the, the job. So presenteeism is costing in the UK more than 1,000 pounds per year per person. So that's a lot. That's a lot if you multiply a workforce. So are you going to encourage the uh, behaviors of showing up at work or showing being in front of your computer, or are you going to develop uh, accountability from your people so that they do the job? If it takes three hours, fine. If it takes 10 hours for them, it is fine, but the, it is based on the outcomes. Otherwise, it means that you are hiring the wrong people that are not going to support the transformation of your organization. But if, of course, your company doesn't want to transform, then alas, you go and do the, the puncher. Ding, ding. So that's, I, I, I think, I hope that I, I, I have answered this question. Elena, do you think I have missed anything? No, no, I think, I think you're, you're quite on point with that. Anything you want to add here, Fernanda, as uh, we wrap up? No, I, I think that I think Ivan articulated it perfectly, actually. Um, so yeah, I don't. Yeah, nothing. Uh, I, I just forgot the second part of the question. After COVID, can online and virtual work spaces thrive? So there is no way that after COVID, there is an after COVID. There is no way that we get to the same old ways that we used to have. The uh, I don't even like the word new normal it is always going to be abnormal because we have developed an acceleration of the uncertainty uh, and it's good. And, and, and as humans, we often thrive in this world of uncertainty. We have done the best things in human history when there has been moments of crisis, uncertainty. So this is something positive. So there is ways, tools, for online are going to become better. Collaboration tools are going to become better. It just needs a little bit of time. We already, because we are following everything that is, uh, that is happening in tech, we know that these certain tools are coming that are making the experience, for instance, of having Zoom calls or having training online better. And it will come, we just need to be patient. And it's true that at the beginning it was a hell to have these Zoom calls, boring Zoom calls with a long, big, long meetings because we were trying to replicate the offline world into the online world. 
and it shouldn't be like this. It is something different. Training someone or having a conference via, via the virtual tools, it is not the same to, uh, way to manage it. So we need to be able to adapt, to change things in order to make it more human. And that's what, what we, uh, that's the, the biggest challenge we have. And we also have another, whoops, another question here um, related to well-being. So uh, the sudden shift in work culture took a toll on overall employee health and well-being, stress, anxiety, and other mental health. Do you think HR can overcome that in the pandemic? Fernanda, I think this one is for you. I do. I think it's a very good question. And I think it's something that, you know, as time goes on, it's just, it, you know, things like stress and anxiety, for one, they've always been there, always pre-COVID. And obviously with everything that happened, that's happened over the last 12, 13 months, it, it just served as, as a catalyst to really force us. It just shook us up and realized, for us to realize how, how prevalent it was in everyone's life and that there is room for, for these for, it, for the improvement um, around that area, absolutely there is always room for improvement. And it may sound very cheesy, but there has to be that, in, it needs to be intentional. You need to want to make those changes in order to, to reduce those levels of, of stress, anxiety, be it in your personal life, be it because of work. It's really a question of looking at where you're at, taking stock of where you're at at the moment, um, the, the components that are affecting you the most and seeing where you can make those changes one small step at a time. Um, so yes, I do believe that it, it is something that will, that will improve after the pandemic, um, during the pandemic, it just, your, your actions have got to be intentional. It, it, that is where accountability is huge. It has to fall on you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just to pick up on that, and, uh, and, and uh, I'm just mindful of the time, we have just a couple of minutes, but uh, and I'm, I, while, while I respond to you, your comment, Fernanda, maybe you guys can also think about any final key takeaways you want the audience to take away from the session. But um, uh, at the end of the day, what I ask, like to ask clients is, what, are, what is it costing us if we're not making these changes? Right. And what are the alternatives if we're not able to take care of, you know, of this state of mental well-being, if we're not implementing growth mindset and curiosity and all these things, what are what is it going to cost us and what are the alternatives? And I think that when we're looking at it from that perspective, then we're a little bit more open to making change happen because change is inevitable. So what is it going to cost us if we're not willing to make it happen? And taken away from this webinar that there's a lot of different mini actions that we can take. So um, thank you guys for being here with us. Uh, Yvonne, Fernanda, any last, last uh, thoughts and before we wrap up? Uh, <clears throat> just to refer to the previous answer of, uh, of Fernanda, I, I think human resources has already shown a way that is possible to do things that look impossible before COVID. Uh, they have shown us a way of voicing out the, the voice of, of, of the employees to take to don't be scared and, and, and to show how important is the human part in, in the organization. So everything is possible. As of that moment that change has started, I think that they are on the good way to successfully manage the design of a new culture in an organization. That's my last one. Yeah, when that was beautifully said, and I'm, I think to keep it brief, I would just, I would implore everyone in HR to acknowledge that like all humans, you guys are also deserving of understanding and compassion, and you're not bulletproof. So um, start taking stock of your, of where you are. And, um, and remember, this isn't only about the the immediate uh, effects it's going to have on your life, but think about the people around you, you know, your family. What do you want for your children? What do you want to see change um, for the future um, of business and organization? And, and what's happening now is pretty special because you are, you're making those changes. So that's where I would end it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Th thank you guys for everybody that joined thank you very much um again this is this is recorded so we'll be sharing the link in case you need to you want to rewatch it and maybe you missed a couple of things and as always we're here to support so really no strings attached 
30 minute consultation if you guys need it it's in the chat we look forward to seeing you again next time thank you guys for being here thank you bye thank you okay. thank you Jidin.